Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning for worship, whether you are in person or whether you're watching online. Um, this week we're starting a new series on um, marriage. And so some of you may think I'm not married. I have no intention of getting married anytime soon or maybe not at all. Uh, and so, but the thing is, the series is not going to be applicable just to people who are in a marriage or considering marriage. It's applicable to all relationships. And um, I found that before when I've gone to marriage seminars or I've listened to a sermon series on marriage that the precepts for what make a healthy marriage also make for healthy relationships. Um, the consideration that we give to each other in our marriages should be the consideration we extend to others in general. Um, and so Mike asked me to tell a funny story um, about <laughs> marriage. Um, and I couldn't, I was having a hard time thinking of a funny story, but I think this story is actually, we experienced this as a family. And um, several years ago, we bought a pop-up camper used. I think we had taken it out once or twice. It was fine. Um, and then we took it to go camping at Fort Boonesboro. So down 75 a little ways. And when it was time to roll the camper down and pack up, the camper wouldn't come down. So we couldn't figure out what was wrong. We couldn't figure out what the problem was. Um, and my husband's a mechanical engineer, and I kind of just assume he can fix anything and figure anything out, and he usually can. And that camper wasn't coming down <laughs> for anything. And we asked the campground if we could stay later, if we could leave it. They said, no, there's actually somebody coming in your spot today on a Sunday. It wasn't, what in the world, our one spot. And... We called one of the places in Lexington, and they couldn't take us. They couldn't help us out. Um, I think we even drove to a Lowe's in Winchester to try to get tools, and he was taking things apart, was not coming down. So one of the RV places in Lexington said, sure, you can bring it to us. So we proceeded to hook the camper, pop-up camper, which was up all the way, <laughs> to the car, to the truck, and... We pulled it all the way to Lexington from Winchester-ish, Fort Boonesboro campground. So we were driving up 75, I don't know, maybe 25 or 35 miles an hour, um, but still like all of the curtains, you know, that are in a pop-up camp were like flying in the air. <laughs> and people would drive by us and they would like point and be like, your camper is up, you know? We're like, thanks, we know. And I mean, of course there was tension the whole time, you know, I mean, like, my husband was frustrated, that was not an ideal situation to drive a camper up the interstate, up, you know, a pop-up camper with everything flopping, and, but then at one point, as we're crawling up 75, and I think it took us like an hour and a half to get to the RV place in Lexington, which should have taken 15 minutes, you know, 20 minutes, but at one point, as we're driving, and I think, again, like, Kids are in the back seat and they're quiet and they know like dad's upset and dad's frustrated and we're all being quiet. But then all of a sudden, my husband just started to laugh and we all just laughed and we thought, this, this will be one of the stories that we tell as a family for generations to come of driving down the interstate with the pop-up camper up and the curtains and everything flopping in the wind. And, you know, we just, my husband said, you know, what are we going to do? Like, you just kind of have to laugh. Um, at this situation. You can't be mad. Yeah, there's nothing else to do but to laugh. Um, and I think that that was a good lesson then. I hope it was a good lesson for our children as well. But sometimes when everything goes wrong, it's kind of like worship team this morning, I feel like, too, worship practice. <laughs> um, when everything goes wrong and it's not in our control, you, sometimes you just have to laugh at the ridiculousness of a situation. Sometimes you laugh because you realize you're not in control. Um, but I think that's an important part of marriage. It's an important part of relationships. Give each other space sometimes when you are angry and just be quiet. But then when it's time, you can laugh together. Um, and I think laughter gets you through a lot of hard times too. Um, and joy, some of the things that we've talked about in recent uh, weeks as well. It gets you through 
the times like the camper, but then also things like worries and concerns and illness and death of loved ones and being able to laugh together through the good times and the bad times. I think that's important for marriage and, like I said, for, for relationships in general. So I hope you're excited if you're here or if you're watching online um, that they, you've got something in the next few weeks for us as far as, again, our marriages and our relationships in general. So um, why don't you stand with me? We're going to pray for our service, and then we're going to do some worshiping, praising God. Dear God, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to gather with others who love you as well. I thank you for health that allows me to worship you. Thank you for all of the blessings. Thank you for safety um, in the last few days in the storm, um, that you've kept our community safe and our people safe. I thank you for giving your son. Thank you for that ultimate sacrifice. It makes all the difference. I ask that you would bless our time. Take the songs that we sing and receive them, and may they be beautiful to you. And I ask that you would just bless Pastor Mike um, as he brings us a message, and that we will listen and we will apply it. We love you. In your name, amen. Sing with me. Nothing can separate, even if I ran away. Your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Your love never for that. 
And Father, it is your amazing grace that covers us. And we thank you for that today. We thank you that we have been resurrected back to life because of you. Because of your grace, your love, your mercy, your forgiveness. And Father, today as we break open your word, I pray that, Father, your Holy Spirit would just speak into our hearts and minds. Remove anything from us, Father, that might pull our focus and let us hear and know you today. And Father, I believe your word is transformational. And I pray that, Father, you would just transform us today more into who you create us and call us to be. And Father, I pray that you would just watch over those that, uh, that are sick today. I know what that feels like. <laughs> I just pray, Father, that you would just wrap your arms of love and grace around them. Let them feel and know your presence today. Heal them, I pray. There are some amongst us who mourn. And I pray you just wrap your arms of love and grace around them. I'm going to bury their head deep into your chest and cry to you, Father. Thank you that you grieve and mourn with us. You comfort us. Give them peace and comfort today, I pray. And Father, we thank you for the way you provide for us. You give to us far more than what we deserve. And I thank you, Father, that as we give back to you, you continue to bless us and you continue to watch over and provide for us. Thank you, Father, for, for each gift and each giver that gives to you. Thank you for the gifts that you give to us, Father. And Father, I pray that you just have your way in this service. Say whatever you need to say to us and let us respond. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Kim, I just have to confess I'm a little mad at you this morning. Uh, last time I preached a couple weeks ago, I said, you know, God doesn't want our ability. He just wants our availability. Bobby Griffin goes down on the worship team this morning. Uh, his wife has COVID and I didn't get the call to sing. I'm a little upset by that, but that's okay. Hey, it's great to be back amongst the living. I feel like my name ought to be Pastor Lazarus uh, because I thought I was going to be dead a week ago. The COVID got me and my wife and um, I, I, it got me first and I, I just felt like as a husband it was my duty to share. And so I gave it to her as well and uh, she's actually still kind of feeling the lingering effects. She's at work today. Um, and so she couldn't be here, but she's still feeling the lack of energy. Uh, it was kind of bad. I was talking to Carol and Jubal, and uh, Jubal did the same thing. I guess I'm following your model, Jubal. You get COVID and you pass it on to Carol. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, I, I, I didn't have anybody to wait on me. I was kind of frustrated. You know, when you're sick, you want your spouse to be there to wait on you and help you out. And I, I had to actually, like, get up off the couch and do stuff. It was crazy. Uh, but no, it, it, was, it, was, it was actually a little bit of a time for us. We had about a week and a half, the two of us together. And no, she's not dead. She's just working today. Okay? Um, but it was great for us just to kind of be there together. Uh, we had some great times of conversation and sleep and snoring. Uh, and so it was, it was a good, good week and a half for us to just kind of reconnect and slow down. Uh, during COVID, her being a nurse, she has not slowed down a bit. In fact, she's overworked. And so it was kind of a good time for her just to kind of breathe a little bit. So it's been good. One thing that was supposed to happen last week that didn't because of all that is going to happen tomorrow night. And I hope you've got it on your schedule. Uh, last month, we preached uh, through the whole series on, pre on prayer. We talked all about having hands up prayer and, and face before God prayer and, and just really having concentrated times of prayer. We had a, we had a prayer that we prayed together. God, open my, my eyes to see, my heart to connect and, and help me, use me prayer. And we've been praying that for a whole month. And we were going to Monday night have a night of just worship and prayer. And with me being sick, the uh, worship team and I talked and uh, texted. I didn't like get close to them. Uh, and so we decided we're going to have that tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. I hope you put it on your schedule that you can be here. We're going to have a time of, of good praise and worship time and a time of just guided, directed prayer, time of testimony. Uh, I want to hear how God's working in your lives. And maybe, maybe how through extra time of concentrated prayer over the last month, you've seen God move in your life and you've seen some of those breakthrough prayers. Remember we said, uh, what, what, was our, what does God hope for us in 2022? And to remember that God dreams bigger dreams for us than we dream for ourselves. And maybe uh, a breakthrough in prayer will help bring our breakthroughs in 2022. So that's my prayer for us. And I just hope that you plan to be here tomorrow night at 7 o'clock to be a part of that. 
Uh, this is our first week. Uh, it's February, and it's our first week in a new series. And I, I just, I, in praying about my series for this year, I really felt like I haven't talked about marriage for a while. And, and, and it's, it's kind of a, a hot button of mine, kind of an area that, that I just really want to, to, to help and encourage and strengthen, um, mainly because I am married, and so I'm kind of interested in marriage. Um, and so it kind of helps. But here's what I want you to know. As we're talking about marriage for these next four weeks, uh, anytime, if you're, if you're not married, when you hear the word marriage, just think relationship. Because I think uh, there's a lot of people in life that marriage is your goal. It's one of the things that you aspire to do, aspire to have in your life. But maybe you're not married right now. Maybe you're single and, 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 and that marriage thing is far in the distance. Maybe you're dating and you're, and you're thinking, maybe that's going to be something uh, we're going to be talking about here soon. And, and so uh, maybe, you're, maybe you're, you're, you were married and you're either widowed or you're divorced. Maybe you're in a second marriage or third marriage and you're going, man, I just really need some tools to help make this all happen. And I just want you to know, through God's grace and his work in our lives, I want us to have the best marriage relationships we could ever have. My prayer over this whole series is that God would do some transformational work in all of our lives and all of our relationships, but especially marriages. And so uh, I, I really want to talk quite a bit this next month all about marriages. Um, and, and just to focus for a second on marriage, uh, if you've been married for a year or less, I want you to stand up. Okay, we seem to have some people that are experienced in marriage. If you've been married uh, five years or less, stand up. Well, we've got some pros. How about, how about 10 years and less? If you've been married 10 years or less, stand up. There we go. We're getting a few more. All right. There we go. How, how about 15 years? Stay standing. Stay standing. Uh, how about 15 years? All right. 20 years? 25 years? 30 years, 35 years, my wife and I would be standing right now, we're, we're 31, going on 32 years of this, which means really we've only had about eight years of bliss, um, and, and that would be me, she's only had three. Uh, how, 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 about, how about 40 years? Stand, 45, 50, look at that, that's awesome. 55, 60, ah, finally got Carol and Jude ball. Look at that. 65, 70, look at that. Look at that. Give them a round of applause. Wow. Everybody who's been married less than 75 years sit down. The others stand up. I want everybody to see this. Stand up. Stand up, McFarland's. This is a model right here to follow. Look at that. And, and, and <laughs> you can have a seat. I can say this because they're good friends, and I can say this. The, the way this has lasted is he doesn't hear real well. <laughs> so, no, 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 no. No. Hey, I just want you to know uh, a lot of the stuff you're going to hear. Uh, some of it's my own material from where my marriage and family therapy uh, program and all that kind of stuff is, but, but I, I want you to know there's, there's some great resources that we're going to be talking about through this whole series. Um, a lot of the practical stuff comes from three books that I've read recently. Uh, first one is The Second Happy. Uh, this is by Kevin and Marsha Myers. Uh, he's a pastor of a Wesleyan church down in Georgia, I believe. Uh, great book. Uh, talks about uh, how, how to make your marriage happy again. So some great things in there. Um, one of the greatest books I've read in life is called the book, uh, is a book called Boundaries, written by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. They've also made Boundaries in Marriage. Uh, great book, great resource. Uh, I think all marriages need to have boundaries. Every person needs to have boundaries. Uh, learning that no is a good word to say and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and this really talks about uh, how, how understanding the choices that make or break loving relationships. Oh, by the way, if you didn't know, your marriage relationship is supposed to be a loving relationship. I don't know if you've learned that yet. And then, and then this last book, um, Lisa, uh, I can't really pronounce her last name real well. It, Turkhurst, I believe. I'll just say that, okay? You don't, you don't know any different, do you? You've probably never read her except for Jim Hampton probably. Um, uh, this book is amazing. Forgiving what you can't forget. 
That's one of the hugest things in marriage. Uh, forgiving maybe things that you can't always forget about. And it goes beyond just marriage. It goes into other issues as well. And, and so these are three books. I'm going to have these up here if you want to look at these later or whatever. Um, I, I want you to just resource you with those. I, I think they're phenomenal. And so you're going to hear about But obviously, uh, the, the biggest portion of, of our series is going to come from Scripture. Because if there's one thing that God talks about a lot is our relationships. Sometimes we don't always hear them in the realm of marriage, uh, but we're going to imp implement that a little bit today. And so we're going to talk quite a bit uh, from Scripture about marriage. Uh, I, I was driving yesterday. I had to go uh, on a little bit of a trip. I went over to West Liberty and back, and, and I was listening on, 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 on one of my apps on my phone, and, I, and suddenly a comedy thing came up. It was just kind of randomly shuffling through things. Bill Ingvall came on, the great theologian, Bill Ingvall. Um, he talked a little bit about marriages for a moment. It was kind of hilarious. He said that uh, women love, hus wives love to orchestrate game nights for couples. And, you know, couples come together and you know, it's usually couples against couples and kind of things. And it's all fun and games until one couple gets mad at each other. And then it gets really fun as we sit and watch those things happen. And, and then men, men like to just kind of go and uh, go on hunting trips with men, guys trips, and, and they go on golf trips. And, and, and it's interesting, women will want to invite their husbands in and be included in these things. But never once have you heard a guy on a hunting trip or a golf trip go, man, I wish my wife was here. Because if you said that, you might get shot. And I, I thought that was kind of funny, kind of fit for today. Um, it, it's interesting, you know, in our society right now, we're doing a lot to try and separate husbands and wives. Over the last 20, 30 years, we've developed man caves in our homes just for men. No women allowed. It's that he-man, women-haters club from the little rascals evolved into this now. And now uh, women are fighting back, and so now you're making she-sheds. And so, you know, it's the, it, this is our territories, and we want to, you know, stay away from each other. Uh, where did we get that idea? Because when I was looking for a wife... And I'll just be honest, I outkicked my coverage. Everybody here knows that, right? I wear, married way above my head. I am the sin that she committed. Let's just get that on the table right now, right? I, I'm her penance. But uh, when I was looking to get married, my whole idea was for us to be together as much as possible. But our society is doing everything we can to divide folks away. Never, never before, like now, have we had guys' trips and girls' trips. And they're good on occasion. I think that's a good thing. I think sometimes we need our own hobbies. We need our own alone time. But I don't want them to become the regular. They should be the, 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 the occasional. And they shouldn't be in place of being with your spouse. We're going to talk all about relationships. And these relationships we're going to talk about aren't just for marriages. Uh, they, they also apply for your, your relationships at home uh, with your kids. Uh, maybe at work with your coworkers, at school with, with other folks, maybe even in the church with each other, and, and even in the community. Uh, so as we talk about relationships, think of the, the wide-reaching circle of relationships that this can all apply to in your life. I, uh, I think it's interesting when, uh, when, I, when I do a wedding, I officiate a wedding. I've officiated many over the years. It's, it's hilarious. Uh, you always have this, this young couple, typically, that, that's up front, and, 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 and they're in love. You know what I mean? I mean, this is like the happiest day of their life. Usually, usually if, if the bride's crying, it's because she's happy. Brides-to-be or brides. If you're crying on your wedding day because you're not happy, probably shouldn't be your wedding day. We'll talk about that also. But anyhow, uh, so they're like in this blissful thing. They've been dating. They've been, they, they've been looking at each other's best qualities, and they build each other up, and, you know, they've gone through the selection process, and this is the dream of their life. And then I look out in the uh, congregation, and there are uh, married couples out there going, dude, you better buckle in. You don't know what you're getting into. And, you know, it's true. Uh, that's what happens is we get married and we're, we're in this bliss. We're in this happiness. We're in this nothing can go wrong. And then all of a sudden, life starts to happen. Before, uh, you, were, you were fighting your friends and your family members uh, against all the, your, your partner's bad qualities. If they'd come up and say, hey, do you know that he did or she did you go, oh, no, 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 no. 
You don't know what you're talking about. They do this and they do that. and They're, just, they're perfect. That's why love is blind. <laughs> it's kind of like buying a house. I look at it this way. You remember when you bought your house? Before you bought your house, you went looking around for the perfect house. You had this list of things that you wanted in your house that it had to be. You needed rooms for certain things, and you needed different you know, sizes and different things and to fit your family, to fit your goals, to fit your future, all that kind of stuff. And you buy it, and you're like, oh, this is the, the, the house of my dreams. This is my forever home. This is great. And then you start living in it for a moment. And after you live in it for just a little bit, you start realizing, why did they put that closet there? Why did they build this room that way? Why couldn't they have done this? Why? You start noticing flaws. Uh, what's funny is they're not major flaws. That house is still the same as it was that you bought it. But all of a sudden, all these little small things start standing up to be big things. So then you have a decision to make. You either sell your house and go buy another one, or you do what I'm hoping that we do with our marriages. We renovate. We renovate. Uh, over COVID, we've done some renovations at our house. Um, there's one, one renovation that has been in process even before COVID. Uh, it's my fault. Um, I, uh, we're, we're renovating a bathroom, and, and I've got to run some electric and all this kind of And I'll just be honest, I'm scared spitless of this because I know I'm going to do something and zap myself. So if I come in on a Sunday and I've got an afro, you know why. But, uh, I mean, it's just one of those things. And so you start renovating, and, and as you renovate small things, things that you're capable of, maybe painting a wall or we've hung some new pictures, that kind of thing, all of a sudden you fall back in love with that house. It becomes your dream house yet again. There are some things that you're going to learn, I hope, over the next four weeks that you're going to be able to do on your own, some small things that will renovate your marriage, will renovate your relationships. Now, I'm also smart enough to know there are things at my house I am nowhere near capable of doing. Uh, you don't want me adding windows and doors. It's not my forte, okay? I can do the small stuff. I, I can even run electric, maybe. Hopefully, Cleve, come help me. Um, but anyhow, uh, but what I'm going to do is there are some things that I can't do, so I'm going to call an expert, and I'm going to bring them in. I'm going to pay them more than what I make an hour to help me fix what needs fixed in my house. And hopefully today you'll understand that there are sometimes in our marriages, in our relationships, where uh, we need to call an expert in. And we, and we need to get expert advice to help us fix what we can't fix on our own. So there's kind of a synopsis of where we're going today. But uh, today I want to talk about something that probably will stun you a little bit about, okay, this is the first week of a marriage series. And so I, I thought, you know, what's one of the best things, one of the, one of the ways that we could really help resource marriages and, and help them to really understand uh, how to be the best marriage they could have? So I, today we're going to talk about how to fight. I thought you guys would laugh a little bit more than that. But because let's be honest, we know how to fight. But today I want us to learn how to fight fair. Because here's what happens in our society. I, I can remember as a kid, my dad told me when I was in elementary, son, you're, you're going to get into fights. It's called life. Fights happen. He goes, here's what I, I don't want you to do. I don't want you to be the bully. I don't want you to start fights. But when that fight starts, there's no fair in fight. There's no holds barred. It's win or lose. It, it's, it, it's, it's, it's either you submit or, or you success. There's one or the other, and that's it. And, and I think sometimes we come into our marriages with that same mentality. That when an issue comes up, all of a sudden, it's no holds barred. It's, 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 it's I've got to win or I'm going to lose. And if I lose, ugh, it's the worst. And if I win, that's the way it's supposed to be. Well, today I want us to, uh, to learn how to fight fair. And hopefully by the end of today, uh, your fights in your marriage will be happy fights. You want to know what a happy fight looks like? I found a video of a happy fight. I want you to take a quick look at it. It's, it's kind of... We need to talk. I saw that project you finished in the garage, and it is 
Fantastic. People are always complimenting me on stuff I do around the house. Why are you so thankful? <laughs> and, and wouldn't you be too if you were married to the, the, the perfect man? You are always supportive. And you always love me and you always will. Do you want to know why? Because you are an amazing husband and, and an even better father. I'm an amazing husband? I'm an amazing husband? You have never once forgotten my birthday, or our anniversary for that matter. Your gifts are fantastic and exactly what I need. Oh, I am not the only one. I know you say for six months. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six months to buy me this necklace. Because it looks fantastic on you. And I'm proud to wear it. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all are bad at arguing. You are my favorite child. <sighs> Home, mine aren't. I just want you to know. But hopefully, by the end of these four weeks, maybe that's going to be the kind of fight chat where you're fighting to complement each other and fighting to build each other up as opposed to fighting to tear each other down. Because here's what I want for all of us in all of our marriages, and here's my goal for us today as we learn to fight fair is that when we, because conflict will happen, fights will happen, arguments will happen, issues will come up. It's called life. But I want us as couples. And I want you in all of your relationships to work toward a win-win. And here's how that happens. When you have a discussion, when you have that issue, when you have something going on, I want you to, to, to focus and think about, I want you to commit to hearing as hard as you commit to being heard. I want you to, I want you to commit to hearing the other person as hard as you commit to making sure the other person hears you. And the key is, you do it in that order. Commit to being heard more than what you commit, or commit to, to hearing more than what you commit to being heard. Our society tells us uh, we need to commit to being heard. In fact, when, when, when we're in society, when we're out and, and there's an issue where we want to be heard, and when we're heard, we suddenly feel better. But in our marriage, when we fight real hard to be heard, it makes our marriage worse. And we have, to, we have to come to a conclusion, we have to come to a decision in our life and in our marriages and our relationships that they're more valuable, that, 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 that they're our top priority, that they're big enough for us to, to, to step back from. And allow our spouse, allow the other person in the relationship to be heard before we're heard. So today we're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, scripture talks a ton about it. I just want you to know, Scripture is just laden with this. We don't always understand it that way. Uh, they're going to be on the screen. We've got a multiple amount of Scriptures. But the first one comes from, first, from, from James. James chapter 19, verse or James chapter 1, verse 19 through 22. says, understand this. Okay, now, as we read this, I want you to, to, to think about marriage and, and your relationship with other people, especially your relationship with your spouse. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, excuse me, slow to get angry, I think we hear those words, but we don't listen to those words. I think we need to hear them again. Let them sink into you. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. It tells me that God desires righteousness in our life and in our relationships especially in your marriage. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly ex accept the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. Think about that for a second. The word that God gives us has the power to save your soul. I want you to replace the word soul with marriage. It has the power to renovate, to save your marriage. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. 
Don't just listen. How many times, it's funny, there's a lot of commentators, a lot of authors that use this passage for all kinds of relationships, but especially for marriage. Can you say this about you and your marriage? Maybe by the end of the day we can. Another great passage, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others. Now, I want you to read it this way instead. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress your spouse. Be humble, thinking of your spouse as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in your spouse, too. In, Philippians, or in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul, some, I'm summarizing this. Paul basically says, husbands love your wives. Wives love your husbands. And then he explains that what that looks like, what that means is, is to sacrifice. It's exactly what he's talking about here in, in Philippians, that, that we're not selfish, that we humble ourselves to each other, that we, we, we say no to ourselves so that we can say yes to them in many ways. And then a passage that is always used, almost always used, in every wedding that I've ever done. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is known as the the love chapter. Just a couple quick verses of it. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to read that again with me. We're going to change up some wording. I am patient and kind. I am not jealous or boastful, proud or rude. I do not demand my own way. I am not irritable, and I keep no records of being wronged in my marriage. I have a, if you've been here for any amount of time much, you know that I I have a, a, a formula, what I call a formula for, God's formula for a successful marriage. And uh, it, it's huge. Uh, it, it, the formula that God has for a successful marriage is, is that you put God first in your life and in your marriage. You put your spouse second. And you put yourself third. I think when you, when, when you think about these passages that we just read, and you think about that formula for success, putting God first, first in your life. By the way, this, this doesn't work if you don't put God first in your own life first. I think that's the biggest key to a successful marriage. Put God first in your own life. Because when you can do that, then you can put God first in your married life, your relationship life, your dating life, and your, your, co- your, your co-worker friend life. Okay? And then you put your spouse second. It goes back to humbling yourself. It goes back to, to thinking of them above yourself. It means not trying to impress them with how great you are, but you're trying to build them up with everything you got. And then you put yourself third. That means sometimes you've got to say no to your own wants and desires. Husbands, you hear me? Because I, I know I'm bad at this. I, I know there are times when, when, I, when I say this, Lois goes, eh, why don't you preach to yourself for a moment? I hate when that happens. But uh, I, I, it, it's easy to get it confused because we want our, uh, our own human nature is we want to put ourselves first. We say we put God first, but we, we put ourselves there and we screw everything up. And so if you want the formula, put God first in your life so that you can put him first in your marriage. Put your spouse second. Put yourself third. In Proverbs, there's two verses that talk about how we typically are. It's great. Chapter 18, fools have no interest in understanding. They only want their own opinions. Sometimes I read that Mike has no interest in understanding. He only wants to to air his own opinions. Uh, Spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. 
Is that what happens when you have conflict in your marriage? As soon as there's conflict, you, you jump right to the chase. You, you, you run in, you're, you're emotional, you're all heated. You're like, I've been wronged and I'm going to wrong you for it. And you just go at it. How's that working for you? <laughs> it usually doesn't work well, does it? So today we're going to walk through a few things. And, 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 and I want to teach you how to fight fair. I, I, I think in, in, in relationships, especially marriage relationships, because conflict will happen, issues do come up. Anybody here that's been married more than a day knows that? Okay? Uh, sometimes the conflict happens as you're walking down the aisle leaving the church. I've actually seen that. Uh, it's kind of scary. Uh, but conflict does happen. So I want us to, to learn how to fight fair in our marriages. Uh, because I, I know it's going to happen. But I want us to allow those things to make us better. And not worse. So there are some, there are some fair fighting rules. And, and, and some of those is there, there are some, some pre-fight rules that we have to go through. Uh, even before we get to the fight. So, so there's a few things I want to talk about real quick. Uh, I call them pre-fight rules that you need to, that you need to know and understand. First one is uh, when, when, when you know that there's going to be an issue come up. When something has come up, uh, you need to call for a fair fight. You, you need to say, look, um, here's the issue. Uh, I, I need to have... We need to have a discussion. We need to have a fair fight. And, and when you do that, then you need to define the issue. You, you need to say, hey, uh, here, here's, here's the issue at hand. Here's, here's what's happening. Here's, here's what we need to talk about as, as we walk through this discussion. So you've, def you, you've, you've called for the fight. You've defined the issue. And then the, the next thing, now here's what happens is we're good at the first two. We're not real good at the third. Uh, the third one is that we need to schedule a time for the fight. Because here's what we typically want to do. We want to jump right into it. And, and, and usually what happens is you catch the other person off guard. Do you know what happens when you get caught off guard? Your defenses go up. Even if, even if you're in agreement with them, because you've been caught off guard, your defenses jump up and you're like, hey, no, 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 i got to have my way in this too. i got to have my word in this. Room. And so uh, the next thing you got to do is schedule the fight. Because if, if you're like me, you have lots of things going on. And, and, and you need to like get your head wrapped around the issue, the, the topic, the subject. But you're not always good at being able to get that schedule worked out. I saw a commercial recently that, that talks a little bit. This is how Lois and I are when we, when we get ready to schedule uh, an argument or a fair fight. Uh, it comes from a Geico commercial. We got that, Jeff? You and me, partner, we meet center of town high noon. Hold on. Nope. Daisy's got last one lessons at noon. Okay. I two o'clock? I got a spur fitting at two o'clock. How's about three? Oh, I'm getting thrown through a saloon window at three. Squeeze you in between swim class and Kevin's harp recital at 3 30. Always eating beans at 3 30. Right. Switch the Geico for more ways to say. Tell you what, what about two? Sometimes it's hard to get our schedules linked up. And so here's what I recommend. Get out your phone, get out your Lois has the old style. Like big, like what they, I think she carries what they carry as an actual write down in calendar. Uh, and so you got to meld your calendar schedule because maybe you have kids at the house and it's not good to, to have that kind of discussion. Maybe this isn't a discussion with the kids around. Uh, maybe, maybe this argument is, is your sex life or your budgeting or, 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 or your schedule or, or what's going on at work or how, what's happening with some of your friends or some other things that are going on. And so you've got to schedule when it's best. When the two of you can be at your best and both there. And then the fourth rule is that you show up at that time and you lovingly engage. You show up. You're present in the moment. And you lovingly engage. That key word there is lovingly. That means you drop the attitude. You drop the defenses. You realize that you're both here for a win. You, you realize that you're in this together and, and you both want the best for your marriage. And so you actively engage. And then the fifth one is you keep the fight clean. You know what that means? No name calling. No, you always, you never, you, you drop those. 
John Gottman, a, a great psychologist, has done studies for the last 20 years over marriage relationships. And one of the things that he's done, and we're going to talk about this in a couple weeks, he, he's, he's got the four horses of the apocalypse. He can predict by your communication with your spouse over an issue up to 90% efficiency whether or not you'll stay married or get a divorce. And part of it is on how you fight. If, if you're rolling your eyes, if you're contempt, if you, if you emotionally disengage and then you physically disengage, those kind of things are predictors of bad stuff. And he's like, look, make sure you fight clean. Keep to the topic. Keep to the issue. Now, here's something else that, that you need to know. There are penalties to apply. All right? So if you're engaged in, in this discussion with your spouse and they do one of these they, they decide, you know, hey, I'm going to just dump this issue on you right here, right now. Throw a penalty flag. I, I, I thought about today having penalty flags for people to throw, uh, but that would be kind of brutal because you'd probably be hitting each other and hitting me, and I didn't want to do that. Or I thought about having boxing gloves, but I didn't want any actual fighting to happen, so, so we just decided not to. But uh, I, I just want you to know there are penalties to apply. And then if, you, if your partner, if the person in, their, in your discussion breaks one of these pre-fight rules, you call a penalty. And if you've had a penalty called on you, you get to look the other person in the eye and say, I am sorry. Please forgive me. I was, I was wrong. And you have to do that three times. You know why three times? Because it's more painful. <laughs> and, and the more pain that it is, the less likely you are to break a rule. So those are the pre-fight rules. Now, now, now for this fight, it's kind of like any other MMA or boxing fight that you're going to have. Uh, there are rounds, and you go through the pre-fight rules. And so now, now we've, we've got three stages of this fight we're going to walk through here real quick. And each of these stages has four rounds in each stage. So it's a total of a 12-round boxing fight. Everybody ready? I, I kind of wanted the Rocky theme playing right now, dun, 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 or, you know, something, something that's just going to charge you for this because uh, you got 12 rounds in front of you. Now, the reality is you may not have to go through all 12 rounds. You may only have to go through four or, 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 or maybe eight. But some of us, because some issues are so huge, we may have to actually go through all 12 rounds. So the first stage I, I call communication. The second stage is a compromise stage. And the third is a is, is counseling stage. And so each of these stages, as I said, each of them have four rounds in them, and, and, and they're all specific on what you're going to do. So we're going to walk through them uh, a little bit. Now, um, when, when God puts people together, they tend to be a little bit opposite of each other. Have you noticed that? Your spouse and you have different temperaments. One is, one is the talker. One, one externalizes. One, 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 one is more extroverted. The other one is typically not as much a talker. Maybe they internalize. Maybe they're, they're quieter, softer spoken. And, and just, for the, uh, just for the practice of this experience, we're going to just pretend that in my marriage relationship, I'm the talker. Because we all know that's not true, Right? Right? Okay. And that Lois is the one that's more quiet. It's just, okay, pretend with me, right? And, and so as we, as we jump into this, uh, as we jump into to, to stage one, round one, uh, you want to start all of these stages, all of these rounds with the one who's quiet to go first. And that's going to stress from some of us. Because those of us who are talkers, you know, as type A people, we want to get our word out there. We want to make sure we're heard. And so that's why we need to go second, so that we can make sure we hear, because that's the goal here, okay? So, 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 so stage one, round one. Uh, here's, here's what it kind of looks like. Stage one, round one in, in communication. Uh, Lois shares her perspective. We've already gone through all the, the pre-fight stuff. We've defined the issue. We've scheduled the fight. We've done all that, right? And so Lois, she, she gets to get out her perspective on the issue. And I... Do the unthinkable. I listen to understand. I listen to understand. Now, the key here for, I'm just going to say guys because, okay, that's, that's me, right? The key for me here is I'm not 
I'm not just letting her talk while I'm reloading the gun in my brain, while I'm figuring out my argument. I'm listening to understand what she said. Round two is I now talk to her about what she's talked to me about. I pair it back, is, is what we call in counseling, is, is that now you pair it back what they said. You, I would look at Lois and go, now here's what I heard you say. And I, and I say what I think she said. Now, to get out of round two, Lois has to say, yes, that's exactly what I said. If it's not, if it, she goes, mm, your head is thicker than I thought. Uh, if, if she looks at me and goes, you are as dumb as you look. Uh, then, then she goes back and she re-explains probably in more basic elementary level communication to me. Uh, and usually there's food involved because that will keep my interest. But anyhow, uh, and so we, we continue. If you, if you don't get a yes out of round two, you can't go on to round three. You go back to round one and you continue the conversation. And we continue until Lois looks at me and goes, you finally get my side. You finally are hearing what it is. And, and what I've heard was not just her words, but I heard her heart of the issue. Because that's the key. It's not just hearing what she says, but knowing the intent in her heart. That, that most likely the issue has, has, may have something to do with me, but it's more for how do we make our marriage, our relationship the very best. And that's the purity of her heart. And then you move on to round three. Uh, in round three, finally, I get to spout off. No, no, no. I get to share my perspective of what my side of the issue is. And Lois, she gets to listen to my side. She, she sits back and she tries to understand my perspective on the same issue. You know, it's, it's kind of like if, if you have a car accident. If you witness a car accident. If you and I were in a car together or we're walking on the sidewalk, maybe you're on one side of the street, you're, I'm on the other side of the street, and a car accident happens here, when the police come and ask us to tell us what happened, because we're, we have different viewpoints, different perspectives, we might have seen something different. And so now, all of a sudden, I'm giving my perspective, my viewpoint on this issue, and she's listening to try to understand. Thankfully, she understands my gibberish, and so we can move on to round four, and she confirms what it is I said. She says, Mike, uh, this is what I heard you say. This is what I heard uh, on from your end of the, end of the whole thing. And, and, and she's listening for my words and my heart and the whole thing. And, and it doesn't go on to round five until just like round two that I confirm that she heard exactly what it is I was trying to convey. She hears my heart and my words. What you just walked through, what this is, this is called the art of communication. This works in any relationship that you have, with any issues that you have. You, you can use this at work, you can use this at school, you can use this in your marriage, you can use this with your kids, you can use this with your parents. You sit down and you hear each other talk. Because you're, you're, you're fighting to hear and not fighting to be heard. Huge difference. And so if, if you get through all of that, then you get to go on to stage two compromise. Just like in, in stage one, the person who is the one least likely to talk on a regular basis gets to start first. So Lois gets to start giving me her suggestions of what she would do to, to solve the issue. And I do the unthinkable again. I listen. I just listen. Her perspective, her, her viewpoint, her solutions. And then, then I get to uh, offer my solutions, my resolutions, and she listens. And so now we've, we've both come together. We've, we've discussed the issue. We've heard each other's hearts. And now we've also offered in our solutions to the situation. And then we get to move on to, to round number seven. Round seven, we begin to discuss all the options. I look at Lois and say, so you said maybe we could do this, and, and that kind of jives with what I said here, but could we add this, and could we do, and she, or she'll go, you know, uh, I like, I didn't think about it that way. I like, maybe you could put that in. And so, so we begin to discuss options, and we, we come to an agreement, a compromise. You know what just happened? A win-win. 
There's no loss here. We both compromise. Here's what's hilarious is when, when, when you have that issue first come up, when, when that problem happens, when that, when that conflict happens, we want to jump right to this, round seven. We, we think it, we're going we're gonna to come and we're going to just vomit our issue on the other person and run away and in 10 minutes it's all solved. And really all we've done is just made a huge mess where now we can finally go, hmm, we have a compromise. And then you move on to round eight. Remember I said God's formula for a successful marriage is you put God first? So, 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 so now you pray about God. Here's what we think might be the best compromise to this situation so that we can both win, so that the best thing can happen for our marriage and for our lives. And so you pray about it. Get confirmation. And then, this sounds crazy. Write it down. Here's what we're going to do. Because maybe you brought in ideas and, and the other brought in ideas, and now you've made them into uh, kind of a combined ideas. And so now you write that down. And this is even crazier. Both of you sign it. Signing it saying, this is what I agree to. This, this is what we've come up with. And this is what's best for us. So you sign it. And then you begin honoring it. Hold each other accountable. Tell each other, hey, I, I need your help to help me do this because I need to, I'm used to doing that. And, and this compromise is now a change. And, and you know how hard it is to change. It's the hardest thing in the world. In fact, even though we know that what we're changing to is even better than where we're at, because we're used to what we're, we've been doing, we want to change back to something worse. It's called human nature. So we hold each other accountable and we help each other out and you sign it and you begin to honor it. Now, sometimes that's the end. You're done. Everything's good. But sometimes there are issues that are too big. There are things that we don't have the expertise on. There, there's, there's more things coming because when we come into a relationship, we all bring our own baggage. We bring our past. We bring our experience. We bring all of our stuff. And sometimes when we bring that in, it's hard to unpack that. And we need sometimes some help. And so round nine is uh, maybe you need some counsel. Stage three, you, you move into stage three. And so now you, you need some counsel. So you guys get together and you, you make a list of some friends that, that you both agree on that are, that are, that are worthy of, of, of talking about this situation. You go with one and, and she goes with the other. And maybe, maybe all the wives go together and all the husbands go together or, or maybe one and one. And, and you just kind of, hey, hey, man, here's my issue. Here's just what we thought about doing. What do you think? And, and sometimes because you get an outside friend that you trust, they've got a whole other perspective that you never even thought of that you go, oh, yeah, how did I not see that? And the next thing you know, you, you've got some good advice. And so then you, 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 uh, you find that list of friends. And here's the other key. You agree on what to talk about. My relationship with Lois is the most intimate relationship I have on earth. There are things about our relationship that nobody but she and I know, and it should stay that way. Her and I have an agreement that we don't talk about stuff that we don't agree to not talk about with other people. There are things about our relationship that's just us. We don't need to bring in other people. I remember when we, uh, we went to a church, I was a youth pastor, large church, and they had a lot of couples our same age. Our kids were... Uh, in children's programming, and, and so, you know, they were in their late, late childhood, childhood. And, and so Lois got invited to this game night. See, I told you women like game nights. And they were playing Bunko. And, and it was it's hilarious. She was like, oh, this is great. I get to build relationships with some new women, and, you know, we're new to the area, and this will be awesome. And so she goes the first time. And, and I'm like, oh, this is great. She gets it because you know, I'm, I'm one of the pastors. Everybody knows me. Nobody knows her. She's quiet. And so now she's getting to know people, and I'm all excited. She comes home, and she is, like, not happy. And I'm like, what's wrong? She goes, that was not what I expected. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, I thought we were going to go there and just play bunko and get to know each other and have fun. But all they did was gripe about their husbands and talk about their husbands and talk dirt and all this stuff. She goes, it was uncomfortable. I said, well, maybe, maybe somebody just had a bad situation or whatever. And so she went again the next week. The next week, the same thing happened. She went back the third week, the same thing yet again. She's like, I don't know if I want to keep going. I leave more depressed than when I got there. And, and part of it is, it's not that, that I'm perfect. It's not that, that, that our, 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 our marriage is like peaches and cream or all roses. It's just there are things that in our marriage that are us. 
that don't go outside of us. And so you need to have a, a list of friends that you trust and agree on what to share with them. And then after you've made your list and you've shared with them, you've agreed what to share about, then you come back together and you say, hey, here's some ideas that they had, here's some things that they talked about, and, and then you decide if, if that helped to make a compromise. And maybe it does, and, and you're done. Your, your fight ends at round 10, and you're all great, and everybody's happy. But sometimes it has to go to the next level. Sometimes you have to get into round 11, and, and you go meet with the pastor. By the way, uh, I know most of you know this. I, I have a degree in marriage and family therapy, and I love to do family counseling and family therapy. My specialization is marriages and teens. And so it, it's a free service that we offer. Uh, we don't charge a dime. If you want to come and just, hey, I need, to, I need to talk, I would love to just sit and, and, and give you maybe some tools. And it's not just giving you advice, but I want to give you some tools, and even some homework assignments sometimes to help build your relationships in any way possible. And so you go meet with a pastor or, or a marriage counselor. Again, you're going to pay uh, a, more than what you make in a, in an hour to somebody that's going to give you some great advice. But it's worth every penny. Everybody, sometime in your marriage, probably needs this. And it goes back to humbling ourselves. It goes back to saying, we can do this. And then after you meet with the pastor or marriage counselor, then you go to round 12, and that's where you begin to process all of this as a couple. And you seek that compromise. And again, it goes back to sometimes we just got to step back from ourselves, get over ourselves, humble ourselves so that we can, we can get to a point where our marriage is better than anything that we could ever dream. Uh, let me tell you how, how this worked out, the situation of this in, in Lois's in my life real quick. I'll, I'll be brief as possible, which means we'll be here an hour. No, seriously. Uh, when, when we moved to Kokomo, Indiana, I was youth pastor, a large church. Our kids were three and four, maybe five, and, uh, and I was busy. Uh, we had a large youth group, and, and most of our kids were involved in activities in, in, the, in school and stuff outside of school, and so most of that happened in the evenings. And so I would, I would go to the office around 9, 9.30, and know that I was going to be out till who knows when. And, and, and that worked for a moment, except that Lois was a stay-at-home mom. And so, you know, she's, we, we, we were so fortunate, so blessed that she could just stay home and be with the kids, but that meant she was always with the kids, and she needed some time out sometime. And, and she would make dinner hoping that I would be home around, you know, 5, 30, 6 o'clock. And, 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 you know, sometimes I would show up 7, 8, 9. And, and one of our goals was, was to make sure that we ate together as a family. And, and, and this happened for quite a while. And, and it just, we weren't getting that meal time together. And finally, Lois looked at me and goes, son, we need to have a talk. She didn't say it that nicely. Um, but she said, look, we, we need to have a conversation. And so I said, oh, what's, what's up? She goes, I'm, I'm making dinner every night for our family. And I, she goes, I understand Wednesday night because Wednesday night's huge of activities and, and we're out till 8.30. I have church from, from 6 o'clock on. I've got worship team practice with the teens and all that stuff. And so she goes, I give you a pass on Wednesday nights, but Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, you're never here. And we're trying to have family dinner. And, and you know, I, I, I get, in my mind, I'm going, I get there. I mean, I've got stuff. I've got kids that I've got to go see, play games and do this stuff. And sometimes I would take our kids and all that kind of stuff. And I said, you know, I'm trying to do the best I can. She goes, but we're never having family dinner. And so we scheduled a time for us to talk. And we both came together with our ideas. And eventually we realized my family is more important than my popularity with teens. And so I had to retrain some people. That, 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 that from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock, I'm not your youth pastor. From 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock, I'm Emily and Drew's dad. I'm Lois's husband, and we're having dinner. And we came to that together. Uh, we, 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 you know, it, was, it was a struggle. I'm like, I, I had to put my ego aside, and there's the hugest part, guys, especially guys. I mean, that was me. Uh, it's probably equal on both sides. But I had to put my ego aside. And I had to begin thinking, I want my family before I want anything else. Because if, if I have 250 kids in my youth ministry, but I've lost my family, I lost in life. Because I only get one shot with them. 
And so we came to this compromise together. I, I heard her heart. I, I told her, I, I think this is what I hear. And she goes, no, you're not listening. Okay. So she had to tell me again. And I'm like, oh, she goes, okay, now finally you get it. And I, then I told her my perspective. And, 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 and she's smarter than me. She got it right off. And, and so then we're like, okay, how do, we, how do we get this together? And we did. And before long, she knew that if I wasn't there for dinner, something really serious had happened. And it's, you know, I get that pass every now and then. But my goal every day, except for Wednesdays, was to be dad and husband from five to seven because that's what my wife and my kids needed. And that's way more important than any paycheck because my thing was, I'm doing my best to provide for our family. And there's that financial stress and all that stuff she had no idea of. And so in our conversation together, we were able to walk through all that. And sometimes that's the hardest thing. Let's go back to that Philippians passage again. Remember this? It said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing out of vain. Humble yourself. Value others above yourself. Look to others' interests and not your own. And Paul took it to the next step. In verse 5, he says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Husbands, wives, you must have the same attitude as Christ Jesus had. And what is it? Hmm. Though he was God, and I know sometimes we think we are, we're not, okay? He didn't think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. Husbands, wives, we've got to give up what we think are our divine privileges, The humble position of a slave was born as a human. Sometimes we just need to step back and be humble and take the position that we're not God. We're not the king of our household, guys. We're not the queen of the palace, ladies. We're in this together. Humble yourself. Take the position, a humble position. He appeared in a human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Maybe we need to humble ourselves in obedience to God, put him first, put our spouse second, put ourselves third. I hope that this helped you today. I hope this is something that you can kind of latch on to and say, how can I make my marriage the best that it can be? I'm going to pray. As I pray, I, if you're married, if your spouse is next, I just want you to hold hands. If they're not there, pretend they are, okay? Uh, I'm not going to ask you to substitute with somebody else. That wouldn't be good, okay? So just hold hands. Put your arm around them if you want. And I just want us to pray together for our, for our relationships, for our marriages. Father, today we thank you so much that you love us so much, that you want the very best for us why you put us together as a husband and wife. That's why you made us in your image. That's why you want us to learn how to fight fair so that we both win, so we can have the best marriage, so we can have the best life, so we can have the best family. And Father, today I pray that you would just help us to take these words, this wisdom that you've given us and apply them to our lives. Put them into practice in every area of our life, in every relationship in our life, but especially in our marriages. And Father, I just pray that you would just help these, all of our relationships, all of our marriages, just make a new turn as we humble ourselves, as we put you first in our life so that we can put you first in our marriage. Help us to put our spouse second, their needs, their wants, their desires. Help us to build them up. And help us to humble ourselves and take the third spot. It's not easy. Everything in the world tells us to do the opposite. But God, thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that you fill us with, that helps us to accomplish all of this. And as we do, Father, help us to give you glory and honor and praise because only you are worthy. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Now today, maybe, uh, maybe you need to go with your spouse and say, hey, here's a couple issues that I have. Some things that are, that, that, that are like been there that you just haven't been talking about that you've kind of pushed back and hope that it stays away. But 
couple of issues that maybe you need to talk about and then define that and then say, let's schedule a time. Get your calendars out. Schedule a time this week. Say, this is, we're going to come together and we're going to talk about this and agree to engage and lovingly engage with each other. Don't reload as they talk. Fight fair. Keep it clean. Be ready to throw a penalty on the other person because it's going to take a little bit. In fact, uh, you might need to make this very mechanical until it becomes natural in your life. You might need to, like, write each of these steps down and walk through them step by step by step and writing everything down. Make it mechanical until it becomes natural in your life, okay? And, and maybe through this process, you'll come in next week just ready to go, saying, man, our, our relationship has changed dynamically. We have been transformed. Oh, by the way, that's a pie-in-the-sky dream. You, you didn't get where you're at overnight. Don't think you're going to get where you want to be overnight. Just like renovating a house, it takes work to renovate your marriage. And to help us one step further, yeah, I love how God orchestrates this. I, I planned this series over a year ago. Been reading and studying for the series over a year ago. January, I get an email about something that's getting ready to happen in Frankfurt and Lexington this month. Uh, there's flyers out there. It's called a marriage date night. A couple comedians and Johnny Diaz, a contemporary recording artist, are, are going to be talking about marriages. Uh, one night in Frankfurt on a Saturday night, um, February 19th at Capital City Christian, and the other night, uh, Sunday night, uh, February 20th, down at, at, down at Eastland Church in Lexington. It's $39 a couple. So it's a good investment. Good time for, for a date night. Go have dinner first. Uh, go to this kind of revive your marriage a little bit, have some fun, laugh together, and, uh, and, and just see what it does. By the way, date nights are something I prescribe to, to couples all the time. You should be regularly having date nights. There's information out in the lobby on this. You'll see little flyers. Pick one up. You know, there's a website you can get, get on and you can uh, schedule, or you can call the phone number and buy tickets. I just recommend that, that this is a great thing for us. I just love how God put this all together. I want you to have a happy marriage. I want your marriage to be the best it can ever be. And I hope you do too. This month we're going to focus on that. Next week we're going to talk about another issue, about how to make your marriage solid. Really solid. So I just hope that you go this next week. Begin doing some of this. Put this in practice. I'll give you some more stuff next week. So there's always good homework, right? This is fun stuff. Uh, if, if you don't have anything to talk about with your spouse, I just recommend you kiss. A lot. It's okay. You're supposed to, right? Hug. You're supposed to. That's how I gave my wife COVID. It was the funnest thing ever. So it's a good thing. Go in the grace of God. You are dismissed. Thanks for being here today.